Welcome to Real Estate Coaching Radio, starring award-winning real estate coaches and number one international best-selling authors, Tim and Julie Harris. This is the number one daily radio show for realtors looking for a no BS, authentic, real-time coaching experience. What's really working in today's market, how to generate more leads, make more money, and have more time for what you love in your life. And now your hosts, Tim and Julie Harris. Three, two, one, and we're back. And we have a very special guest today. No, it's not my lovely wife, Julie Harris, who is sitting with us at this big marble table in Miami, Florida, for an incredible C5 global event for eXp Realty. But we happen to, I think, um, mug in a <laughs> <laughs> Michael Valdez. You can't mug a willing victim. <laughs> <laughs> who was kind enough to agree to be our very special um, guest impromptu. and our impromptu guest. And so we just started having this really fun conversation. And I thought to myself, why am I not recording this? <laughs> That's what I did. It was like crazy. This is awesome. Um, and so, yeah, Michael Valdez, welcome to Real Estate Coaching Radio. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here and hang out and finally meet you guys in person. Yeah, likewise. This is really great. It is. It's Isn't fun. it weird? Not, not, I mean, it's great virtual and everything, but actually yeah. seeing somebody. Yeah. <laughs> it's sort of like, it's, it's fantastic. I mean, the relationship changes then, right? It does. Because it deepens. It so sure I does. love that. Importance so, of events for sure. Yeah, absolutely. So I don't like it when people ask me about uh, myself or Julie, and so I'm going to ask you a t- talk about yourself just to see, make you uncomfortable. <laughs> awesome, let's do it. Let's do it. So, so you I'm, are. I'm going to play Glenn. I'm going to take a moment and pause with every. No, go ahead. <laughs> so you are uh, somebody who's been in the real estate industry for a long time. Yes. And you've played many different roles. You were um, the CEO of Sotheby's International, no. correct? No, I was the uh, I was the global vice president for Sotheby's, but I was the senior vice president for Realogy, right? Um, and covering all of the Realogy brands, which was Sotheby's, Century Twenty One, Coldwell Banker, ERA, Better Homes and Garden, and Corcoran. And how many years were you in those? So I was at Realogy for fifteen years total. Fifteen years. Wow, yeah. that's a pretty. There's a lot of people that sort of take that corporate. Uh, pathway you kind of see on their LinkedIn profiles that kind of go from one brand to another so when you I'm just really curious you went from sort of taking this predictable future in corporate real estate world to working for eXp Realty I mean what what were you thinking what were you, what was I thinking <laughs> so you know I got to tell you something I had met uh, Jason Guessing um, at a uh, conference in New York and we were doing a global real estate conference and I was on the panel with Jason and there were four other CEOs and we were all talking about global real estate. And at one point, Jason sort of turns around and we didn't know each other. And he said to the host, you know, I don't really feel qualified to be answering these questions. We're only in two countries. Maybe you should just direct your, your questions to Michael. And I was just like, well, that was really benevolent. And so then the conversation shifted and they were talking about disruptors and everybody was talking about Compass, right? And so I actually said, you know, I think from the people sitting on this stage, the only true disruptor is EXP. And I actually thought that because, you know, you had the technology, you had really sort of like the different aspects of what it was. And so, you know, and I wanted to return the favor. And so I said, the only true disruptor really on the stage, I think is EXP. And so then afterwards, uh, Jason approached me and he said, would you ever be open to having uh, a conversation about an EXP global? And I said, listen, I'll have coffee with anyone. And that really is how it started. And then literally we started talking and I started, you know, learning about EXP. I didn't really know much about it, you know, the intricacies of it. Um, But the more I learned, the more I thought, wow, this is really interesting. And then literally two months later, it was Inman. And Glenn and, uh, and Jeff Whiteside, our CFO, come down. The three of us are supposed to have a 20-minute meeting, which then lasted two and a half hours. At one point, Jason says, I'm going to miss my train to Boston. And Glenn sort of said, we're not done. You can leave. And so we just stayed, and we started creating what this could be. Well, and I remember when you came in, the excitement from um – having you take over global, which really didn't exist prior to you. I mean, it did in a minor sense. And what you've been able to do, uh, we were just talking about this over in the uh, sitting area over there, was extraordinary. 
You've since you've been at EXP for how long? It's been uh, joined in May of 2020. Isn't that incredible? Yeah. Barely, I mean, year and a half basically. Yeah, that's it. Year and and a half. And you've brought in how many different countries? So we did 14 countries thus far in whatever it's been, 14, 14 months span, 15 months, yeah. And you're intentionally slowing it down fourth quarter so you can basically <laughs> re-fortify essentially. Is yeah, what you so you know, we're taking a little bit of like, we're taking the, the, the foot off the, the gas pedal just a little bit so that we can actually build what we've already created. So we really are introducing teams and brokerages into a lot of these international countries and really building from there so that we can actually start having that, uh, that agent count growth. So we've grown, uh, when I first started our agent count numbers um, outside of the United States probably represented um, just shy of 3% of our agent count and now it's 11%. Well, so putting those numbers in perspective, four, you know, three to 11 doesn't sound that impressive, but in sheer numbers, it's an enormous amount. You're talking about seven or 8,000 agents, correct? Yes, it's, it's, it's about, uh, it's just shy of 7,000 agents outside of the US at the moment. Yeah, and uh, countries like India and some of these other countries, they're growing so incredibly quick. Oh my quick. gosh, and India is a great story. We've been open in India for nine months and we are just at 1,000 agents right now. <laughs> That's insane. Isn't, isn't that it? crazy? Well, I mean, you know, you, we say it because we've been, Julie and I, you, we've all been, combined experience here. It's probably close to 100 years, which is a little embarrassing to say, right? Crazy. I'll never <laughs> say that again. I know, I will, I will. <laughs> well, I won't even do combined ages. That's really depressing. <laughs> Please stop. <laughs> yeah. Please stop. <laughs> Julie, Julie's 35 forever, so. Yeah, it's exactly. <laughs> but, yeah. Um, you know, it's incredible to be part of this because Julie and I and you, of course, have seen these big brands have their day in the sun and how they've really grown, but nothing has ever grown like this. It's but so true. It's not just the organic growth. You might've had a great franchise model and you had people that are excellent selling their franchises, great region holders. Uh, Julie and I were um, with Howard Brenton when uh, the Keller Williams thing was really coming on strong. Yeah. And that was very impressive. And the growth out of Keller Williams sure. was incredible. And the, and the company they built was extraordinary. It is extraordinary. But when you look at, for example, the growth curve of Keller Williams uh, versus EXP, and you know, it's, it's amazing. It just is amazing. I, it, we were just actually talking with Orlando about this. Can you think of another, anything else in real estate, maybe pure tech platforms aside that have grown like this? I actually can't. And that's what's so exciting about this. And you know what's so exciting is the fact that we're just getting started. I know. Isn't that insane? It is insane. I mean, we're only in 18 countries. My former company, I was overseeing 113 companies, countries, excuse me. So we're just starting. Here, this will blow your mind. This podcast is listened to in over 60 different countries. That's insane. <laughs> it is I insane. love it. But why? I love it. I mean, that tells you that there's a lot of people around the world that sell real estate. Absolutely. That are interested in, you know, ideally, hopefully what Julie and I have to say on this podcast, but they're really interested in being successful in real estate. You know what's amazing? Even where we are now at the C5 conference, we have so many countries represented for the countries we're already open, yet we actually have people in the audience from countries we're not even in yet. I was gonna ask you that. How many, if you were to open up the gates again, realistically, how many countries are teed up to come in next? So we'll probably do another 10 to 12 probably next year. I think that's a fair number. What would make a, so someone's listening now and <laughs> so I'm just thinking about some of the countries we have people listening to us and some of the country names, I, can, I had to look them up on a map. Right? <laughs> but so if someone's in one of these countries and they want to uh, consider having, uh, being the you know, first, essentially opening a country with you, tell me what you look for. So there is, that we actually do have a consumer facing website. It's expglobal.partners with an S. And that site has a form where anyone can come in and nominate a country for consideration. And we're looking at the idea that we're building a global brand, right? And so we have very hard costs that we need to do because we're not a franchise. So we go in and we build, we build a corporation. Uh, we get our legal stuff together, all of our banking, all of our finance, all of our accounting, the back office infrastructure. Then you have to sort of go in and get the team in place, the local team in place. So that takes a lot of resources. And so what we're looking at is to see what the opportunity in each of those countries are as we're building this global brand, because now we're building a network, right? And so we want to make sure that those countries where we're in already, wherever we go next, will benefit them as well. 
So you have to have, you've had success stories, obviously, in the, India, you mentioned, 900 people. Not yes. short of power. So there must be a certain qualities that you look for in the people that you want to have oh, EXP gosh, partner yes. with. Can you talk about that? Absolutely. I think you need somebody who is an entrepreneur, somebody who really understands what this model does. Because it's not just about the high commissions, the revenue share, and the stock. It's about what's behind that, right? We really are a movement of what this is happening. When you're sitting there and you're talking to people that have said that revenue share allowed them to have a life-saving operation, how do you put that on a P&L statement? It becomes something that is so emotional. It becomes something where it's this that was built and was created is now so much greater than any one of us. It's larger than us. And so what you're looking at is what I call this, this movement that's happening. Because it's a movement about helping people. And that's the sort of the core of what this is. And that's why I think it's been as successful as it's been. What was that thing the person in India said to you? Oh my God, it was so amazing. So there was a large team from one of our competitors that came over in India. It was 300 people. And they, uh, you know, it's 2 million agents in India. So a 300 member team sounds huge here but it's commonplace there. We're talking to somebody who has a 900 member team right now, but um, he said he was gonna come over and he says, before I come over, I really wanna to talk to you, Michael. And I said, of course. And so he said to me, do you know why I'm ready to move over? And I said, please tell me. And he says, because EXP has a model that was built for humanity. That was such an impactful statement for me. The fact that you know somebody who wasn't with us understood and encompassed our message, our core message, in such a beautiful way and was able to say it so eloquently. I've used it in every one of my speeches thus far because it was, it impacted me. And it was a beautiful message and a beautiful way to say what we're doing. So we talked about this a second ago, right? Yeah. And we were trying to, we we're sharing our stories and how we came to EXP, which is pretty funny how similar they were. But the uh, thing that you said, that we said, that's impossible for us to uh, explain with words or even videos, frankly, right. is what you just said. Yes. The, the, uh, it's a movement for sure. Yeah. But the, you know, it, we can say a little, you know, clever things like the old rule was, you know, it's what you're paying your broker right now. The new one is what is your broker paying you? But that doesn't even come close to scratching it. And it's not just, the, you said it, it's not just the numbers. It's not just the revenue share, but it's the revenue share. It's not just the stock awards, but it's the stock yeah. awards. It's, there's something that's happened that we've never experienced before. I'm looking over at Julie. She's yeah. nodding her head. <laughs> that we've never experienced before outside of, I mean, maybe church or something, really. I mean, and, and I don't understand Absolutely. it. Do you understand it? Why is it like this? Why this is something that feels almost like people listening right Evangelical, now. Evangelical, right? Exactly. Yeah. But it, is not, it sounds like we all joined a cult. <laughs> But you know what? It was so funny because with my, with my old company, I was there for 15 years. And, you know, and, and, and I said, I never heard anyone ever say to me that Realty changed your life in the 15 years that I was there. Now, it may have happened. No one ever said it to me. And the moment that I joined EXP, I heard it from the very first week that I was here. And then at first, I was actually taken aback. And so, you know, the very first week I was there was for our shareholder summit that had 17,000 people in attendance. And that was my first week that I was at EXP. And so it was just sort of like trial by fire. I jumped right in. Everybody knew who I was at that point. And then it was one of those things that when I kept hearing that, it made me uncomfortable. I'm born and raised in New York. We're taught not to trust anything. And so it's sort of like, what is going on here? And so you start sort of thinking of what is wrong with these people, right? It's sort of like, that's like, what's wrong here? And what did I just Stay do? Stay away from the Kool-Aid bowl. <laughs> and then I was just like, all right, well, I've already burned that bridge, so I'm all in. So let's just sort of like figure out what's going on here. And then I realized, oh my God, it really does change people's lives. And it changed mine. And so at that point, it's so impactful. And at that point, the conversation does change. So this is the experience Jules and I had when we went to, when we, <laughs> essentially, when they finally got us to go to an event after we'd been stalked to get into EXP for like <laughs> six years, same with you, it sounds like, yeah. um, that we were at this event and there was like 200 people in there and Julie and I didn't sit next to each other. We kind of split the room because 
we don't get a that was smart. Well, we get recognized together, but we don't get recognized when we're not together. So that it's is funny. so funny. So she went to this side, I went to this side, and then we just started asking people and trying to get to you know breathe their air, find out sure. what's going on, you know, find out if there was some sort of secret cult ritual that was you know <laughs> happens over lunch. So we ended up, uh, and, and on the way back up, we were driving up, you know, from uh, uh, San Antonio back to Georgetown, and we were talking to our. It, she was. We were talking back and forth, like. What the hell was that? Yeah. I mean, I don't get it. What was that experience? We've been to a billion real estate events. We've hosted a billion real estate events, and it's never like that. Yeah. And then she actually came to the conclusion it's because they see a path forward that gives them a sense of freedom that they never even they have never even intellectualized they could have, right? They were what we were around. You were not around people that are you know some. This guy's making eight hundred dollars a month. Pays us freaking car payment or his truck payment in Texas, right? right? This guy's making $3,500 a month. This guy's making $35,000 a month from revenue share. When you have people that are making money passively, it just removing some of the, uh, the burden of the financial stress of, you know, being able to move away from having all your income be transactional. That's what we were, that's, that's part of it. You know, what's interesting. It's not just about the freedom. It's about the legacy. And that's so much more important when you're sort of talking about when you're having such larger conversations where you're talking to somebody about not only their wealth, but their generational wealth and what they're leaving as a legacy behind. That's almost such a large conversation that people really can't sort of like wrap their heads around it. But that's the conversation. It's not just about your own financial freedom. It's about your legacy that you're leaving behind and the generational freedom that you're building. That is definitely true depending on their age, right? Yeah. The older they get, maybe 40 and older, yeah. that's definitely, and if they, you know, there's different, but definitely, I, I completely agree. Yeah. And that is something about revenue share that people don't understand. It creates, you can, it is a, you know, depending on your structure, you can pass revenue share. Correct. It's an inheritable asset. That's right. And, and that's, again, something people really don't understand. It's so incredible. Just the concept of it. I mean, you, you, in your background, you must have, when you finally figured it all out, didn't you have that moment where you thought to yourself, damn it, why didn't I think of this? Well, yes, but it was <laughs> like, because I came from a banking background, and we were talking about this earlier. And when I actually started to start talking seriously to EXP about coming over, I pulled every SEC filing that they had, and I read it. And I was just like, there's something wrong with this model. It's just too good to be true. So there has to be something wrong with this and I'm gonna figure it out. And I was sort of like looking at this and I was just like, I can't poke the hole in this. I can't figure out where this is. And then it was just like, damn it, why didn't I think of it? <laughs> I know, it's so true. It's so awesome. Because I'm not Glenn Sanford, that's why. <laughs> well, I think what, think what he did when he did it though. I mean, he was, he was so far, this, oh. you'll appreciate this. This is total nerd stuff, right? You can handle it, I'm sure. You st <laughs> I'm older than you. I can handle this. <laughs> by four years. So, uh, respect we, your elders. <laughs> I am. So, we, we were listening to something about Thomas Edison. We talked about this in our podcast the other day. And people are talking, you know, if you want to look at historically what, in, what influenced someone who's a true innovator, that wasn't even the word, the term they were using. When you want to look at essentially somebody who really was like a Michelangelo type. Yes. Or, for example, the um, look at Steve Jobs. Yeah. So, the smartphone would have been developed, but he basically developed it five years before everyone else did. Sure. So when you're trying to quantify who essentially or where our greatest innovators were in the history of humanity, it's how many years they were allowed us to skip ahead. Does so that make true. sense? Isn't that so interesting? True. So uh, true. You could, uh, we can talk forever about um, you know, uh, Elon Musk. Yeah. I mean, come yeah. on now. Absolutely. Seriously, think Absolutely. about all the things he's done. Yes. It's extraordinary. And the way that he thinks, absolutely. And in his day now, he gets a lot of people that don't understand him because he's yeah. so abnormal. But what he's doing is he's a modern day Michelangelo. 100% agree with you. And I'm sure this would embarrass Glenn if he heard us say it, which he will because he's listening, yes. I'm sure. But he is a Michelangelo. He is the innovator. He's the one that's moved the industry ahead. Well, what I, Julie and I were thinking about this after listening to that podcast, how many years? Absolutely. By more than five. Oh my God. Well, think about it. It's so like, so the platform's been around for 12 years, right? And we're all a virtual company where everyone's an avatar. And this is a virtual company that started in 2009. So nobody had heard about coronavirus back then, right? No one's talking about a pandemic. No one's talking about a response to something that was a global pandemic. And how do we actually 
relate with one another in community remotely when you cannot leave your home. We'd been doing this already for a decade before coronavirus even came in. So he's at least jumped it by a decade. And that's what was so extraordinary. We were just talking about that downstairs in another language. Uh, but it was something that is so interesting when you start thinking about it. When you start thinking about Glenn's mind. I mean, it's sort of like he's way ahead in, 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 in that chess game. Yes, because back in 2009, we were all basically at Zillow, Zillow this, Zillow that, buying leads, building teams, franchise this, independent this, big brokered this. And he had the idea, why don't we just create a big international brokerage and license all 50 states, not yep. going to different countries, and then do it virtually. And what costs can we eliminate from the whole, and, and, and like the process, we're, you know, your old world, right? That's right. All those franchises and franchisors and all the rest of it. I mean, to have all that stuff, it wasn't necessary. It, and then pass that money back to the agents. That conceptually is almost, it doesn't seem like it's a thought. Like I said, it's, it's five years, 10 years into the future. And here's an interesting question. I actually, Julie and I actually talked to Glenn about this, is what is the probability? How could somebody actually catch up with the XP? That's so true. Yeah. I keep saying that. It's sort of like, look, we are, we have this internal goal of, you know, getting to that 100,000 agents, whether we do that in this calendar year or not. It's, it's, uh, 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 but wait, but wait, wait, we wait, will. but wait, but even, but even like, you know, we're a, we're at 66,000 agents as of this conversation, and we have an incredible trajectory here. You know, we're in our last quarter. We've got about 80 days left, and we're, we, we, we are running really, really strongly. But even if we fall short and we're like at 80 or 85,000 agents, guess what? We're still the largest independent real estate company in the world. <laughs> and that is extraordinary. It's extraordinary. Do you realize I was on um, I was on the Alpha call this morning and there was a um, there was a stat that we did um, forty percent of our historic agent growth this calendar year. That is incredible. Yeah, that's true. Isn't I mean, that if you extraordinary? Think about it, mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, uh, what nine hundred ninety nine agents came in last week or the week before Correct. that? Correct. Last week. Yeah. Why last not a thousand? Week. I know. I mean, we need to stop being so lazy. You know, Come exactly. one person. Couldn't you have called one other person? Oh my gosh. <laughs> well, we are here helping for land. Otherwise, we would have. Wow. We slacked. I know you did. But that's that's the thing. It's it, so we hear sometimes, and I'm sure you hear it too. People are worried. Well, there's going to be some sort of competitor that's going to come in but we're so far ahead it's like it's like the elon musk electric cars right. thing so julie and i were as we told you driving around the country for 60 days and we would go to nowhere usa we're sure. from nowhere usa so i'm not making fun of nowhere usa when i say it like that yeah and there would be a charge station there yeah in this dusty in town Iowa, that looked, you know yeah there's corn everywhere a gas station and there's eight charging stations <laughs> And it looks great. It's incredible. Yeah, but he that's put amazing. he put those in before he started yeah. selling yeah. a lot of cars. Yeah. But that's what Glenn did. Yes. That's the thing that's an innovator truly does. It's really exceptional to be a part of. It's so true. And then so for someone to come in and try to be a competitor for those of you who are thinking that, you know, EXP is going to all of a sudden have a lot of people chomping at us. The amount of growth, it's well, it's just like the, the big manufacturers now trying to catch up with uh, Tesla. They might be able to make a really great electric car, but they don't have the grid. That's right. And I, you know what's interesting is the idea of our agility as well, right? We're a very agile company. We have very little sort of bureaucracy for us to start making decisions and things like that. When we go into every country, do you realize that we have a different model in every country? So it's the idea that we are a local player. We come in and we understand what the entire market does. We study the market. We come in and we have our core of what is true to EXP with a very high commission rate, the, the stock options and the revenue share, but the numbers are different. So percentages might be different. And what we do is that we see what everybody else does because real estate is a local business. And I think that's been what some of the, um, the pitfalls for a lot of our that's competitors. That's really interesting. Yeah. A lot of our competitors have one model across the world. Right. It's sort of like you we're not one homogenized population globally. Real estate is local. And so we come in and we study the market and we build a local model and we are a local company with a global footprint. And it's very hard to compete with us.
Let me let me uh, unpack that a little bit. Sure. What you, what you said was really interesting. So um, one of the appealing factors that a lot of brokers and teams find out about EXP is EXP is not a franchise. They want you to keep your existing branding. They want you to keep your existing everything. Yes. So it could be Tim and Julie Harris Real Estate brokered by EXP. 100%. Your colors don't change. The logo doesn't change. They're not coming in there and telling you how to run your business. You obviously know what you're doing. Keep doing it, but it's brokered by EXP. So you're saying when EXP goes to India or Spain or Italy or yep. Germany or wherever else we go, we're also partnering with existing established people, and we're not telling them to change their names. It's you know, absolutely. It's you know, Carlos. Not them what to do. Exactly, yeah. and so then as we have the same appeal of the local well-known brands. Hundred percent. And then it's just brokered by EXP. That's right. That I hadn't even considered that from an international perspective. Yep. That's actually really genius. Absolutely. And we go in and we're very competitive in the model that we present because we study what everyone else does. And because of our size, it allows us to come in at a competitive advantage. It really does bring up some other, this is something again you find when you're recruiting agents, is a lot of them will think that they have to, that the brand matters, right? And they don't understand that they are the brand. Hundred percent. When you do so, that, oh that that's funny to hear from you because you came from a company I where know. it was all brand. And let me tell you, that actually took a while for me. When I understood, because when I was fifteen years at the other brands, the brand the brand led, right? And your your consumer was the end customer. Here, your your client is the agent. The agent is really this is an agent centric company. And this is all about building the agent into the brand. The agent becomes the brand. And that's what this is. And I was like, once I got that, I'm like, whoa, wait a minute. The agent's the brand? And it was just like, wow, that's like unstoppable. And it has been. And it's been extraordinary. Once that clicked in my head, because that was a really big sort of like click that had to go off. But once I understood that, it was like, wow, this is really truly the only disruptor in the industry. It's extraordinary what's happened. Well, it, exactly. And, the you know, we... You, Agents listening, let me just sort of decipher what we're talking about. If you're a new agent, you don't quite understand how true it is what we just said, what Michael just said. But if you're an experienced agent, here's all you have to do. Well, I mean, remember when Julie and I were selling a lot of houses with Remax, and we went and we would do a survey after we had a closing, just because we wanted them to rate our team, and the team would get a little bonus based on how, if they got five star ratings. And then we added the question, "What real estate brokerage are Julie and I with?" And they thought we were with our own. They didn't even realize we were Remax agents. I love that. Mm -hmm. But it's that's true. That's brilliant. That's brilliant to do that. Mm -hmm. You know, because that's actually a lot of people don't give themselves enough credit. That's right. Absolutely. Right? Right. They just think, oh, I need the brand behind me. That's why this client went. And it's sort of like re real estate is a relationship business, period. You only do business with people that you like and trust, period. It doesn't matter where you are. It's sort of like, and then why not be someplace that can build you on a global scale? So macro issue? Can I ask you a macro issue? Sure question? you can. This is about the economy, not necessarily about uh, real estate. Yeah. So inflation, right? Doesn't appear to be transitory. Does seem to that we're in a long-term cycle of inflation. Yep. We've seen that um, housing has appreciated. Well, let's call it what it is. Housing yep. is inflated. Right. Agents call it appreciation, but kind of the same. Feels right. the same. Yes. Feels the same until consumer items start to be correct priced. Uh, you know, re dealing with the new reality of inflation. Sure. So we're entering into this phase of the economy. You and I aren't that you know different in ages, but back when Jimmy Carter was president, that's the last time we dealt with any sort of inflation. Right. We're going to a different cycle. From your perspective, what do you just what are you thinking? Look, I think that at this at this point, you have to sort of remember um, when back in two thousand and nine, I was actually selling real estate, and it was actually my best year, and where a lot of other people had obviously the worst year they've ever had. It's the idea that we serve our clients and the whatever the market is doing our industry we're still there to serve so i was i was actually selling in miami at the time and so we because of my banking background i knew a lot of financial companies that were coming in and they were creating vulture funds you remember vulture funds of course and so they were coming in and buying let's, let's tell them what a vulture fund is so vulture funds were when everything was really like going down the, the the drain with values you know you had a lot of developers that couldn't finish their their buildings because they their construction loan stopped right you had a lot of people that were upside down you had those that even the short sales they couldn't even do the short sales so there was a lot of foreclosures 
banks and financial institutions did not want to be landlords and they became landlords. They had a lot of real estate. And so vulture funds came in, which were started with hedge funds. And the vulture funds were actually buying all of these properties at pennies on the dollar, really. And so I was representing some of these vulture funds that were coming in. So I was in, I was in South Florida at the time in the Miami area selling real estate. And it was that type of uh, business that was happening. So you have to adapt also as a real estate professional in here. So whether we're in an inflationary um, situation or whether you know this sort of rides out for another period of a couple of years, which I don't think it will, um, there is that sense of we're only there to serve. We're only there to serve what it is that we're doing. So that sort of like from an agent point of view, when you're sort of thinking about that, it doesn't really matter what's happening outside of the forces you can't control. I would always say to just focus on that that you can. So at the end of the day, agents are needed whether the house prices are going up or 100%. down. Right. It's the skill set of the agents that there changes. So you had to learn and adapt to basically deal with the distressed real estate. That's right. And whereas before, I'm sure down here especially, you were selling a lot of very expensive luxury real That's estate. That's right. And it changed within 24 months in a very meaningful way. So agents, and here's to Michael's point, and Julie and I saw this you know, coaching, the people that are generally speaking, the, the top agents in a market that is a strong seller's market have the hardest time transitioning to a market that's changing or especially a market that starts to essentially become a distressed market. So it's not, it's the, uh, be careful of your level of adaptability. And one of the best litmus tests as to whether or not you're gonna be able to uh, succeed in any market in any direction is ask yourself how dug in you are about your beliefs that things won't change. You said about 24 months, or is there any particular reasons behind that? No, not really. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, but but just, it's, it's fascinating though. But here's what it is interesting. I think that there is a disservice for someone who's entered the real estate industry in say the last five years or so that all they've known is mm -hmm. an up market. It because you don't have the skill set to really be able to know the flip side of the market. And all you have to do is, you know, markets are cyclical. There is no argument there. So they go up and down, and that's what every market does. And so the period of time between them is a different story. But when you start looking at this and you start looking at somebody who's only been in an up market, it's a disservice to it's them. Michael, it's everybody. Who's, I know. But think about it. Since, I know. It's but it really is, actually, when you start thinking about it, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. Se seriously, since yeah. 2009. What percent, that's, how many ages really do you true, run actually. into? Yeah. yeah. They're all, none of them. The turnovers. Right. We know, from right. Our, we know from our, they can't hear you, you know. Yeah, we, yeah. Know for, we know from our coaching business that uh, none of them were in the business back then. Yeah, you're actually right. Yeah. Right? So you start thinking about that. It's, and then you start sort of thinking about they, who that individual is as a person, right? Because I've heard infinite stories of brokers that are now in, in in a multiple sort of like you know a multiple ask situation if you're representing the seller and some they're not just they're just not even responding to their colleagues these tables when they flip mm -hmm. that sort of you know sort of like audacity that somebody has because of their displaced level of confidence in the market they're going to be very humbled if they are not sort of understanding that now the humility has to happen now when you're up. Absolutely. But so, you know, my mind's bouncing around all over the place, probably because you and I are having diet Pepsis. <laughs> but, but, here, but here's the thing, how it's affecting the market now. And you've seen this too. Um, Julie and I like to talk about driving uh, from uh, Las Vegas to Laguna Beach, driving on, through the desert and driving through uh, Victorville, California. Yeah. And there was a builder that had a sign up. This sounds like a joke, but it wasn't. A billboard, buy one, get one for free. Come on. Yep. Production houses, he couldn't give them away. Literally, he was trying to give them away. Wow. Isn't that incredible? That's insane. But, so, but you're seeing something like buyer agent commissions. I know you're international. I don't yeah. know how much you're... But people don't know outside the United States and Canada, the only two countries where there's an entire to a buyer agent commission that the seller pays. I know this is a you know thing yep. hotly debated right now on the legal stuff and all the sure. rest of it. But what we're seeing, and it, you know, coaching client wise, is these buyers agents are now having to uh, essentially they're working for hundreds of dollars sometimes in some of these markets just to get the house for their uh, for their uh, you know their buyer. Sure. And uh, the we have also heard and we've seen the the big eye buyers are trying to uh, lower, they're testing the market to see how little a co-op they can offer before it actually adversely affects the ability to sell the house. Yep. We've seen that happen in two different markets from our coaching clients. Yep. So it makes sense that what's gonna happen is people are gonna start realizing 
like the rest of the world, aside from the United States and Canada, the buyer agent commissions might be something that agents are no longer just going to have to assume it's going to always be part of the transaction. That's very true. They're going to have to start selling to the buyer why the, they're worth whatever the commission is. That's exactly right. I mean, that's, that's kind exactly of a fascinating right. trend that no one's talking about, too. That's very true. And all it would take is a couple little legal you know, things happening here or there, and that's what would happen. But really, if you want to talk about, you know, how one of these I buy, the I buyers are the ones that probably will try to squeeze that out yep. of the transaction. Absolutely. So again, listeners, don't be scared. Here, where's where you go with this, right? I know some of this, we're talking about distressed and buyer agent commissions going away, but here's the fact. It all adjusts. Michael said it. It all adjusts. It, because back in the market where I was talking about two houses for one, exactly. I bet you he was paying a 42% buyer agent co-op that's, too. <laughs> it's but, so true. Right? But th that's how it swings. I mean, it's really, it's really insane. A hundred percent. How's it work in other countries and other, the countries with buyer agent commissions? You know what? It's sort of like real estate is so different around the world. It is just extraordinary. You know, no, think about about most countries don't even need a real estate license, right? So when you start thinking about that and then you start sort of thinking, my God, how do you regulate this? How do you start sort of like thinking about this? There is, a, every country is so different. The United Kingdom, for example, the average commission in the United Kingdom is 1%, total commission. But, but let's let break that down because it's even more interesting than that. You don't, there's no MLS. There's no MLS. Yeah, so you go from broker to broker to That's broker. That's right. Yeah. And everyone has their own. There's no MLS in New York City in Manhattan, right. by the way. And so there's no, there's no MLS at all in London. And London, actually, London is an incredible. I lived in London for four years. And um, there's actually a term in the real estate company, in its real estate industry in, in the UK called gazumped. Have you ever heard this word? No. So if you have a deal, you could have a signed deal with the seller in the United Kingdom. I can come back and tomorrow Julie can offer me another another 500,000 pounds. She now has the deal. You just got gazumped. The deal is not a deal until it's a deal. It doesn't matter who, what's signed, doesn't matter what's what. If there's a better deal, I'll take the better deal. Wow. Until the property closes. Try doing business there. And probably even until you get the keys. Well, until you get the keys, right? <laughs> until, until, until sort of like the money's in the other bank. Exactly. There's actually a term, gazumped. Yeah, it's, it's, this goes back to uh, Julie and I have worked with the National Association of Realtors for a long time. Yeah. And um, it, people do, you know, they complain about their NAR dues. If you guys had any clue <laughs> what NAR does to, uh, it's not just what we're talking yeah, about. Yeah. This, this is obviously from a real estate perspective is sure. self-serving. But I remember during the real, the real estate crisis, Julie and I were on the phone with someone from National Association of Realtor, Real, Realtors, and he had walked into a meeting that he was late to with the FDIC. Am I getting all these facts right, Julie? And they, the banks were in the, the, the lobbyists for the banks were in the midst of uh, basically sealing a deal with the FDIC to make it so the banks would tell the agents what the commissions were going to be on the distressed real estate. And National Association of Realtors, thankfully, still has the strongest lobbyists in the world. That's you know, crazy. And, and turn it around. Isn't that a whack? That's we, insane. We had yeah. him on our podcast. No, this it was before as a podcast. It was a yeah. webinar. It was like nobody. And then people complain about paying $600 right, a year. Right, right, right. It's incredible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is. <laughs> Well, as you're in this job, we've been going for 30 minutes. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. So, uh, what are you? What would be the biggest like three things that you see coming for EXP Realty in the next 12 months that you can talk about? Right. <laughs> He's giving me a big smile. <laughs> that, you, that you can talk about that will blow everyone away. And if you don't want to be that specific, you can talk in generalities. Sure. Um, look, as I said, we're we're just getting started. We're in 18 countries. We're looking at doing another 10 to 12 next year. Um, we're created these regional hubs now. And so we have our EMEA hub, which is Europe, Middle East, uh, India, and Africa. I put India in there for now. Um, and so we're creating our APAC hub next, which is really filling in a lot of the Asia countries and really getting a foothold there. We already announced Japan coming soon. And we're looking at other strategic countries throughout, uh, throughout Asia Pacific. And then, of course, Latin America. And, you know, you and I and uh, Julie are here at a conference that is all Spanish speaking right now, the C5 conference. And so that is something where the, that focus on Latin America is huge. And so uh, we'll be continuing there. And I think there's going to be some uh, great announcements that are coming maybe even sooner than next year. We're going to make some ma major announcements at EXPCon next month.
That's incredible. Yeah. yeah, it is pretty. And you mentioned all these countries and you mentioned all this growth that's happening internationally. And I just, I'm, I'm trying to, you know, in my, back of my mind, I'm thinking back to the Tim and Julie that were hesitant to join DXP for all those years, you know, back prior to 2019. And, uh, you know, back then it wasn't anything like it is now. You weren't involved in the company. There wasn't yeah. all this international growth. There wasn't all this incredible, all this but the, there's really no reason at this point not to join eXp Realty. We say there's two categories. There's agents that are eXp curious and ones that are just basically haven't had the time to fill out the application yet. Because, <laughs> I mean, really, at the end of the day, there's no real compelling reason not to do it. Whether you're yeah. a big broker or a small broker or whether you're a team, when you look at the, the economics of the whole thing, yeah. from the individual agent's perspective, but even the largest of teams, it's extraordinary. It's, it's night and day. You know, I was having dinner with a friend of mine. She's uh, a real estate journalist for the New York Times. And so we were having a, a conversation and we had dinner the other night. And she sort of said, you know, I've never really asked you about eXp. And we went through and her jaw like was open. And he says, she says, why doesn't everyone join eXp? <laughs> and literally that was the, and I was like, why don't you write that? <laughs> Did she? <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> she will. Well, but other, other people have. Other yeah. people have. I mean, there's a great article in what Motley Fool recently. Oh, and God, others. yes. Yeah, Absolutely. I mean, but that, I just, I don't know, guys. There you go. You, Julie, you want to say anything as we wrap? Julie's been sitting here steadfast. Yeah, and it's, it, You said it the best. I mean, it is astonishing. It really is. And I don't know why anybody would wait at this point. No. I really don't. There's no reason. There's nothing compelling to wait for. Yeah, you that's know, right. Take action. That's well, awesome. so there you go. That's our impromptu sitting at Orlando Montiel's dining room table at a suite somewhere high up in a building in Miami, Florida. Um, and uh, we sprung an interview on Michael Valdez. I you love were, it. You are, you, are, you are a gentleman. I sincerely appreciate it. I'm looking forward to doing many, 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 many international uh, sponsoring events with you in the future. And you know what? And it's sort of like everything that, that you and Julie have done for this company already is just amazing. And the lives that you've touched, thank you for what you've done. It's been extraordinary. And I, it, it is my honor just to meet you now and to really be in business with both of you. Likewise, my friend. I sincerely appreciate that, too. Thank we do you. feel the same way, because at the end of the Thank day, we you. really are changing lives. We really are. It is amazing, isn't I know. it? We're blessed. I, we really are. It's yeah. amazing. <laughs> Have a Thank great you. day, listeners. We'll talk, you, talk with you on the show tomorrow. This podcast is a part of the C-Suite Radio Network. For more top business podcasts, visit c-suiteradio.com. <laughs> <laughs>